Welcome, welcome, welcome to Wire Rapper Book Lovers. No, I'm Gareth Book Rapson. Lovers Wire Rapper. Book Lovers Wire Rapper, we always start with this. Yeah, because it's al alphabetically advantaged if we're Book Lovers Wire Rapper. And that's how we are in the list of programs. We should do it that way. Yeah. Welcome to Book Lovers Wire Rapper. Cool. I'm Gareth Rapson, and I'm with, you're with co-host co Steve Lawrence. And this is your one-hour program about the big, wonderful world of books. Hello, Gareth. Um, Yes. <laughs> now, you find us on 92.7 Arrow FM and Channel 41 on Wellington um, Wire Rapper Freeview TV. Now, big month October, things are happening. There's a lot of books here today. Mm. Um, but, Steve, let's begin. Why word? What's been happening? Well, um, we've had two events since we last spoke because our September event was on the last Saturday in September. Last Friday? It was right. a Friday, I think. Yep. Um, which was just after we had a little thing, which was the biggest thing we've ever done. Probably never do it again. It was called Inside the Song. It was intended to be a couple of songwriters would come along and explain how they write songs. It turned into about a um, pretty significant gig. We had a, about a 20 voice Maori choir. Um, we had Barry Saunders who finished it off. We had uh, Brian and Ryan from the, the Dead Zephyrs who contributed some bits and pieces and then went on to win the National Battle of the Bands with the, the Dead <laughs> Zephyrs. Um, and then we had a couple of uh, young people, Meg Hunter and uh, another young lady whose name I can't remember. Um, and it was, yeah, it was... <laughs> and how, was, how big was the audience? Uh, well, as many as we could get in, so that was we we ran it in the foyer of the event centre rather than the auditorium. Oh, you'd uh, need all that seating for an event, wouldn't you? Or oh, no. everyone stood? No, 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 it's set out seats. Okay. Uh, but it was full, so we had, I don't know, 110 or something. Um, it's the first thing we've ever charged for, but it's still 15 bucks for adults is pretty reasonable. It's less cheaper than going to the movies. Um, and they got value for their money? Well, I think they did. I mean, to get the insight into songs, and, and with the, with the audience a muso crowd, they were you know appreciative there for the oh, yeah, yeah 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 it was a, it was certainly a different not entirely but a largely different group than we normally have, which is what we like you yeah know, no no big range of stuff different people come along to different things no good on good on why word I mean it's 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 expanding the brief but and and this and this. Yeah. The singing word, why not? That might have almost expanded it to the point where it <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, needed I, a bit of surgery after. You know, it's, um, I mean, what bigger venue could you get the, than, you know, than the Carterton Town Hall, really, in the valley? I mean, that's, that is a big... Mm. But as I say, we didn't use the auditorium, which would no. seat 300 um, and cost us a bit more. That's next year. Yeah, possibly. And um, after that, there was a second, the writing yeah, we, composition? Yeah, we like, once a year probably, um, we like to run a little writing competition where people can contribute a piece of short fiction or a poem or a little story. It doesn't have to be fiction. Yeah. can be anything, as long as it's short. Um, uh, we like short, but looking at the books in front of you, mm. writers don't. They, you know, they're paid by the word, obviously, but short was short yeah because we ran it in the cafe at Elmo's uh, we had quite a good crowd and a number of people um, entered pieces um, and came and read them um, good readers yeah yeah no, um, nothing like the person who wrote it to actually know how to read it yeah yeah okay yeah. so that was that's all good we've done two or three in the past um, we, and we've tried to often tie them in with something. We've, something one year when we around the golden shears time, we people had writing about sheep. Um, <laughs> we had right. people writing about spring. When sep we did a September one around the daffodil festival. Was this one about politics? Or? No, this one was about love. Love, which love is it. a broad concept. Can be about anything. Can be about cats or dogs or chocolate in this case or. Um, you know, tragedy or comedy or... And so in the next event? The next event uh, is on the 12th of November, which is a Sunday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon 
uh, in the Rangatahi Hub, which is the kind of the basketball y court yep. scout den at the back of the event centre. It's called Writing the Walk. So That's right. So we have the editor of the New Zealand Walking magazine um, come along. It, it's the literary connection is that it's it's really about the art of writing for magazines. How you put something together that a magazine publisher will publish, but it's also going to be about walking um, because it's part of the Wairapa Walking Festival. It's part of our um, which I've seen the publicity for and looks. Interesting and inviting. And yeah, I and you, you've you told me before you've you've actually run one. I, I ran an event in the part in a, when I was kind of associated with Y Art, and, mm. and went, we went around and looked all the at all the art and sculptures and stuff on walls in the, mm. in the town um, as a, one of the walks. Yeah, and, and attracted a good crowd. Mm. Yeah, mm. so there was all sorts of walks, um, and our event will be kind of alongside that. Excellent. Now the next event we were talked about last time, but we was on the, you know, was book hop. Yeah. How did that go for it? Well, I um, thought it went really well. Uh, um, from a purely mercenary perspective, our sales were slightly up for the same period last year when we did it. So it's done over. It was done sixth, seventh, and eighth of October. The seventh being the Saturday, which is National Bookshop Day. And last year, the bookshop hop, the idea is that you get a little map, it's got 12 bookshops on it, you get a stamp everyone you go to, the more stamps you collect, the got more chance of winning a share of $1,000 worth of books. Um, last year we just ran it on the Saturday, so people were literally running in and out of the shop, which hmm. I don't think was quite, that's not how we like to do things. Uh, this year we ran it on the, over three days, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, it was a lot more pleasant. Um, and the net result, I think, was probably about the same. I think more people went to more bookshops because it was just physically possible to do that. Without going nuts. And and the winner? I can't remember. Someone. Was it, one, was it wasn't one of your customers or somebody you knew? Or... Oh, it's not someone I know. No. It may well have been someone who came into the shop. I, I don't know the answer to that because yeah. we didn't actually ask for ID. Oh, no. But it was so what a great prize. Yeah, and it, well, it was three prizes, so it was spread over um, three winners and quite a lot of people from outside the district, which is kind of what we like. Excellent. Well, it's a great thing to sit around over, over a cup of coffee with a pen and paper and say, if I had a thousand bucks to buy books, what would I buy? Mm. You know, and get into all your notes on your desk saying all those things that I, I wanted to read. Mm. Okay. The... Um, and October is the arrival of books. The boxes are flying into the shop. They are, and we always get this problem every year, except it seems to be worse this year, where I've also got all the calendars, and they take up quite a lot of room, so you can display them. And right. then we've, started, you know, we've got all the Christmas cards, and you have to display those, and we've got all these books. and yeah. So I am running these ads saying, please come and help. Come and buy something. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, let, we've got a lot of books. Let's let's rip into the books right away. I'm going to start off firstly with a um, a paperback, a waiter in Paris. Now, um, adventures in the dark heart of the city, um, and by Edward Chisholm. And I really love this. Mm -hmm. That's why I put it up there as number one today for me, my first off the rank. Um, it is an adventure in the dark heart of of a city, of, of a city much loved, and a city that we're, you know, watching on television every night as our football team gets ready, um, and we we see the Eiffel Tower mm. every night. Excellent. And it's a kind of, it's a, a memoir of a, a, of a Parisian uh, waiter that takes you below the surface of Paris into its sort of glorious underbelly. Now, our, our young Edward, our young, he's a young graduate, girlfriend in London, and they decide to go and make a, a life in Paris. Um, he's got a degree, but can't get a job. And eventually she has enough of her providing all the income and him just trying to find work. And so she decides to go back to London and he decides to stay. <laughs> and, um, and it's how do you survive? The funds which he had are slowly shrinking and he gets a job in a sort of um, high-end bistro 
and he, the, here's a problem. He doesn't speak French, um, which well, he has like the odd word. Mm, so like baguette. In, yes, like and that. in the book, it's like every blank, 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 and then here's the one word that he knows: blank, blank. And so, but they, he gets taken on as the runner. Now, the runner is the um, he wants to be a waiter. Hmm. Now, the waiter has a certain part of the bistro or the big restaurant, which is a kind of higher end type of thing, and a big outdoor area where they do the drinks on a terrace. Um, but anyway, and his job as the runner is to, the waiter takes the order, hands it to him, and he runs through to the back of the restaurant to the pass, which is a, a big area yeah, hole in the wall yeah, which next is to the a, kitchen which is actually to the down into the kitchens which yeah. is at a lower level but there are three sri lankans who run that and you give that to them and then waiters come back and forth to get the meals and everybody's taking other people's coffees and orders and it is chaos at the pass and the the runner then is clearing the tables and bringing orders and away he goes it is ruthless. It's mm. like 14 hour days, no breaks. You just go. Mm. And um, it is survival. And he's absolutely, he has no, he can't be paid because he has no bank account that, because you need certain things. And he, he can't get a social security thing because he needs this, that, and the other. The, the French bureaucracy is to sort of clamp them down. And he is, but survives by eating leftover food sort of as it's sort of you know grabbing a baguette or a roll or and a coffee and and becomes a smoker mm. um, which is part of the, the whole deal very feral existence where you live in on the outskirts of paris and the cheapest of accommodation where you share a room with somebody else um, and who works at different times um, and you are at the bottom of the food chain and it's um and it is tough my, my understanding of how those French restaurants work is that the, the waiters actually pay rent, so they pay the establishment for the right to work there so that they can collect tips. They do, there's not, they do rely on the tips, yeah. which are, you know, are good. Mm. And, um, and, of course, they are meant to pay the runner a small, a few euros a day, all mm. these waiters, of which he wants to become one of them. And... Um, but a lot of them don't because he's just the Englishman, mm. the English, you know, who, and so they ignore him. And um, then he, there is, then it suddenly he realizes the rise of the of the runner, and mm. he starts to manipulate the whole situation. Like he just won't support your part of the restaurant because you're not paying him any money. Any. Yeah. So that's how. And that yeah, way that's goes, capitalism in action. It is, and it's sadistic managers. Is that there's, there's um, you are fighting colleagues. All right. Um, it is. Look, it is. It's, like, it's working a in a law firm. Yeah. <laughs> and the people around them, they're kind of like thieves, uh, narcissists, ex legionnaires, paperless immigrants, drug dealers. You are with a very strange bunch of people but I love this book hmm. it was um, it's a kind of it's it's a survival story George Orwell in 1935 wrote a book called Down and Out in London and Paris where yes. he went and lived with the, the homeless and all that we're back in that and people have compared that to this book saying this is as well written and as well as, as you know as, hmm. as compelling like that book um, Short, very punchy chapters. He's a great observer of people, poverty, the French. It's just, you know, it's just terrific. Um, it's the city of love with a very exploitive industry um, tucked in behind it. And your success depends on the failure of others. And very, it's not a jolly read. <laughs> no, this is, but it's, but if you like TV, if you like food, um, and it's not how TV prevent presents food it's kind of like this is the real thing highly highly commended um a waiter in paris two other food books one from um my dear wife gail who has told me about al brown now al brown i think he grew up here he's got a connection here yeah yeah it's Worry a boy i think eat up the new zealand batch edition um he's an icon of chefs in New Zealand. Mm. Um, he's, he wrote a couple of books like Go Fish. Oh, he's several, yeah. 
Steak, staked or something rather, I think was one. Staked, I don't recall that. This is it something called smoking or something. Yeah. Smoking. Anyway, yeah. this one is big, generous book, a revised edition. So he's mm. had a, there was a slim one. This is now full of memoirs. Well, a mem it's a mm. memoir type of book. It's a, full of stories. Um, Gal made this um, salt and vinegar schnitzel chicken vich schnitzel so you take a slice of chicken breast chick, chicken yeah. breast and then it's yeah, coated in salt and, and vinegar yeah. chips oh, okay batch food yeah and then and then you drizzle vinegar over it to really give out the sort mm. of pretty interesting the um apparently i've got some turkish delight in meringues is one of his little that's coming at me mm. i've been told girl really thought this was a good good book um any cook and foodie in New Zealand would enjoy it. Can I find it at Elmo's? Look, I don't think so, and I'm not quite sure why not. Perhaps we can. I, I, we've got so many bloody cookbooks, I lose track. Right. And the last one, um, very quickly, it, this is the year of the taco uh, in my life, and I'm starting to research it, and I found Sarah and Otis Frizzell. Now, I think Otis is might be Dick Frizzell, the artist's son. Um, they run a food truck the Lucky Taco up in Auckland, and this is the story of their adventures. Great photos, great recipes. Looks like Dick did the cover, doesn't it? I, well, no, that's that's Otis. He does that. Okay. He, he, he is an artist too. Um, he might be in that book that Dick Frizzell did on kind of the history of art. He starts starts off talking about how he went to see the Sistine Chapel or something with his son, who might be this guy, yeah. um, and Otis or whoever it was, I can't remember, it was, said something about, oh, I reckon I could do that, because he's a, uh, did stage decorations. Right. <laughs> and he said, what you got to do is you just do it in little bits, and it's no problem. No problem, yeah. <laughs> Whoop out the Sistine Chapel. There it is. <laughs> Good book on tacos. Um, there are many, many books on tacos, but this, as a Kiwi book, Keep an eye out for it. Now, over there... Now, what, you, the, what you've got... The one thing I think you can't show people, but the description of how you actually eat these damn things, because it's all about posture, isn't it? Because it is. they, they... Bits fall off them. Yeah. And, and it, there is a, a, the, um, the photo of how you eat these things, which is you, might, you get a stance where you bend over. Mm. Um, Legs wide apart, so you don't get things on your trousers. And, and you don't get splatter on your kicks, yeah. as he puts it, on your sneakers or whatever, all that sort of stuff. And um, so you're leaning forward, you know. Mm. Um, but, of course, you're buying it from a food cart, so you are not sitting. No. You don't eat tacos sitting down, you know, because... Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's, anyway. I can't deal with them. The soft tacos I can manage, but the hard ones, they just they yeah. fall to bits and everything falls out of them. Yeah, now this is the year it's of the taco good technology. in my life. I'm, I'm making a progress on this is going to be where I'm going. So okay. I, I'll be keeping us up with the taco world. I think you should concentrate on fajitas. It's much better. <laughs> now, but let's, with, you've got a fascinating pile of substantial non-fiction books. Yeah, so last month we, I brought along a whole bunch of new fiction. So I thought, to balance the books a bit, I would bring some of the very recent non-fiction that we've got. Um, I don't know what order to do things in. I'll start with this one because it's just turned up and it's, it's, it suits me. Um, this is a book called Conflict, written by David Petraeus, General David Petraeus, who was the head of the US military in Afghanistan, I think, and went on to become head of the CIA and then got sacked for... Didn't he, he, he got political or something or other well, in the Rolling no. Stone magazine. He had a sort of counter to the, the, the main narrative and well, he fell he was, out of favour. He shared a few things with his girlfriend that was perhaps highly confidential, I think. These girlfriends. Anyway. Oh, my goodness. But this is the evolution of warfare from 1945 to the war in Ukraine. Um, it's a big book. Uh, 500 odd pages and also towards the end talks about where he thinks wars are going to go because I've been following the war in Ukraine with minute by minute detail and it has just it has not gone according to anybody's plan 
at any point. I mean, the Russians, when they started, they had their sort of three-day war and they, the guys they sent in, they made them take pack their dress uniforms for the victory parade, but they all got killed. Um, and then we had this the great Ukrainian counter-offensive for the summer, which has gone, gone about 10 kilometres. Right. We've had a huge Russian counter-offensive around some place I can't pronounce, Avdivka or something, where they're losing a 1,000 a day, people a day killed in action and 50 or 60 tanks a day. I mean, this is... It's just 1916 and the first day of the Somme all over again. Um, yeah, no, it, and, it's, <laughs> and it falls off, off the radar a bit now with the Gaza thing, so suddenly it's, it's the second story. Um, mm. Well, it's because it hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. But the challenge of a book like this all comes down to how good a writer and mm. how engaging. Where, mm. How does he rate on that? Well, he's written this with someone called Andrew Roberts, who I don't know much about, but it says... Andrew Roberts is a biographer, an internationally best-selling historian. Professor Lord Roberts is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Historical Society, and is a Roger and Martha Mertz visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So he's got some literary cred, right? And, um, and, and General and, Petraeus knows what he's talking about. So together, I, I've read. I haven't read. I mean, I only got it unpacked it on Sunday, I think. So I haven't read much, but. Um, and I just read a bit about the first few days of the war in Ukraine. Yeah. It's really So this will appeal to history buffs, military buffs, yeah. um, contemporary, well, because it gets up to the latest. Yeah, yeah. It? it gets so ahead of the latest. Um, so, yeah. is it, it sounds grim, you know, like, is, is this we're all going to hell in a handcart and this is not helping? No. Conflict, I mean, I mean we don't. Is it just... Oh, well, it's, war is kind of grim because people get blown to bits. That is, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just saying, but it's... But, well, a bit, but, it'll be interesting to see the reviewing and also to get your, when you've finished it yeah. next month, to give us a little heads up on... It's, it's quite, you know, it's just a matter of fact. Like, what are the chapters? Death of the Dream of Peace, 1945 to 1953. Wars of Decolonization, 47 to 75. America's War in Vietnam, from Sinai to Port Stanley, so that's obviously the Falklands. Cold War de Numan, New World Disorder, the war in Afghanistan, the Iraq War, mm. and Vladimir Putin's existential war against Ukraine and the wars of the future. So it's everything that's happened since 1945 in See, I, I like the writer of cloud. Robert Fisk. Yes. Who I love writing on this sort of stuff. Mm. And he was a, like on, on, the, on the deck correspondent, you know, and I thought he was fabulous. And those were really good books, but he was just a, a flat-out brilliant writer. Mm. Um, well, this, just, is, this is higher level, yeah. a bit more analytical, strategic, I guess. But, you know. All right. Hey, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'll, I, I, I would, you know, uh, I'll keep an eye out for that. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have saw you, seen you necessarily as the person who might want to read that but, but I know I, a, I know a few blokes who do there won't be I don't know any women who would but that's yeah. just me being sexist again yeah no I have a eclectic taste and if it's a book's got the good heads up mm. and I do struggle to understand these big Ukraine gaza things you mm. know and I do like the the history to try and get some comprehension of the incomprehensible mm. um, yeah another book okay um, another one we've just got, Simon Winchester, who's written a few books over the last few years that we've done pretty well with. He wrote Atlantic, and then he wrote Pacific, and then a couple of years ago he wrote a book, which I think Velda might have reviewed here. Yep, she was a fan. Uh, called Land, which was yep. basically the history of how people got to owning bits and pieces. This is called Knowing What We Know, The Transmission of Knowledge from Ancient Wisdom to Modern Magic. So... It's a great premise. Mm. Um, and, and glancing through it, it looked, it looked readable. And, and, and he is readable. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think there'll be an audience for that. Oh, yeah, there will. People like to learn stuff. Yeah. Um, These are very... Intelligent, worthy books. Well, yes. 
like you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't say that like you're surprised <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i mean I, as you know as like you were showing me the you know um the harry book the um <laughs> spear spear us uh, yes rather <laughs> rather than the spear which you know and uh, which uh, i love all those comic and we we, we are threatening to do a, a books of humour um, Well, we can read episodes. jokes. We'll be able to read jokes. So That's right. We'll be good at that. That's coming up to you in the new year. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm up for that too. And yeah. I, I also may feel I read that, so I'll, I'll read to that. So we may this that may be back um, being discussed mm. in the future. Yeah, well worth it. Okay. Jumping across. This, which is an Elmo's, mm. um, is a flat-out classic. Yep, I reckon it would I be. I think every Kiwi, um, no matter what age, would love this book. Should and be in every house. Yep. I, I, we've, uh, Which people, I hope it will be because I've got plenty. I force <laughs> it on everybody who wanders through our, uh, you know, into our house to pick it up and say, you know, Elmo's is waiting for you to go up and get it. This mm. Christmas is coming. This would be an outstanding Christmas present. I believe so. Yes. You know, I, I think it's it's good. It's... um. So you better explain what it is. Yeah, it is. It's Brendan, ben, Brent, Brenton Graham, who's a, a digital colorist, mm. and um, and and with Jock Phillips, who's like you know New Zealand history. Yeah, he didn't think about war memorials and all yeah, that stuff. And, and he wrote the hundred objects, mm. which I also saw down in, yeah. in Elmo was waiting for us. Um, it celebrates the rich stories of of Arith, a, a, a Taroa. Um <laughs> And it's it's the restoration of all these black and white images into colour. And there's about 200 images here. Um, window back in time. Mm. And uh, brings out the detail which is often missed. You look at a black and white photo and you see, some, you see stuff. When it's coloured, you see other stuff. Mm. So things Much more detail. Yeah. And, and it's, it's other things are emphasised. And... and Warm colours in it give you a certain, and colder colours, and it's kind of like art, and you have a more artistic reaction to it. And they've um, done just a brilliant job colouring those photos. They look like they were colour photos. It doesn't look like they've been recoloured. No, no, it, it's, <laughs> the tech is great. 1860 to 1960, so yeah. the treaty, 1840, 20 years later, they start to have New Zealand photographers, and it's way back in there. There's a great photo here from the wire wrapper. Hmm big cabbage photo actually um the and it's really back when we didn't live in the cities a lot of the people lived off the land um mm. and you know the chapters the maori world land of hard work high street fun and games war the domestic world heroes something for everyone mm. and i just i have picked this up many times and and just sat there and and imagined my past now there is a slightly salutary effect here that i suddenly realized that some of the photos i'm actually alive in these in this history book you yes know, and i go that you know um that's that's not so good but <laughs> it's it's as, but that maybe that's why people of a certain age will like that book because they go, actually, I can kind of remember that as I a remember kid. That, yeah. And, you know, if you want to see trams in our capital city um, or just the cities you visited as a kid um, brought to life with magnificent colour, this book, absolute winner. I know what you mean about being in things because there's a lot of stuff which, you know, is, is presented as being historical, which I still think are current events. But... <laughs> Another book um, which I saw in the listener, um, Your Brain on Art, How the, the Arts Transform Us by Susan Magnuson and, and Ivy Ross. Um, kind of like this, because it, it, it also had a big section right at the start about poetry, which I thought, well, hey, why word? That works for us, the written word. Um, and it's really about neuroaesthetics of the brain and what happens to the brain when it gets into art situations and it takes art in the broadest broadest thing but it begins with poetry and it goes how our minds when they look through mri machines and people are working with poetry how what it lights up in a most interesting way in our brains and it, and it goes um it creates the the thinking in here is that go this is a goes back in time when the oral tradition um, really, you know, back in the Greek days when 
poetry was prescribed as a medicine to calm us down and to get us into a different place. And um, it kind of it d demonstrates the complexity which our brain constructs the world. And so this book is um, about how all art, sculptural, painting, architecture, music, all that things, affects our brain. Now the idea, they explain how like we, our, our eyes take in about 5% when we walk into these situations or are doing art, but in fact a lot of it is that at a level we do not comprehend. And, but our, you know, when they can now look into our brain, they can see all sorts of things have been activated. And, and so they're going, there is, this is very, very interesting um, about art. And it. the, um, that's the importance of creativity. Um, and, and also it's art as therapy. That's its big theme, mm -hmm. is that this stuff is actually good for us. Um, so like the first time... I came across adult colouring in books was years and years and years ago before that became a thing and all the stockbrokers in New York were colouring in because it re relaxed them. Was um, I used to get books for people who were working with people who'd had brain injuries and the act of you know colouring in between the lines that was part of the process of helping the brain regenerate. So. Interesting. This book is into that in a very readable way, um, and it's it's not too scienty, you mm. know, too scientific, and it's kind of written in a way that we 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 and you know I liked it. I mean, I have an interest in this sort of stuff, and um, it's sort of it was a good book for me. At at almost look, I think so. I think it's, I've seen it everywhere. It's, yeah. it's unity. You know, on the Unity book list, mm. it's, it's, it, it rates, so it's, it's, it wouldn't be surprising if it was there. Yeah, I think, I think it is. I, I, I haven't actually got the catalogue engraved in my memory, but I seem to remember the cover. <laughs> <laughs> we'll inform you next time. Yeah. Now, what about what else? What else we got over there? Okay, That's well, a we uh, we? couple, yes. couple of New Zealand works of non-fiction. Um, this is the biggest selling work of non-fiction in the country at the moment. It's called, where are we? You can't, hiding, gone away somewhere. Anyway, Gangster's Paradise by Jared Savage. Uh, a few years ago, can't tell you how many, but not that many, he wrote a book called Gangland, which sold extraordinarily well. And this is kind of bringing it up to date. I'll just read you the little blurb at the backs. Gangster's Paradise is about drugs, gun and money lots of money. As new gangs like the mongrels and comancheros challenge the dominance of the established gangs like the headhunters and mongrel mob, New Zealand is witnessing a weighing of gang activity the likes of which has never been seen before. Lethal turf wars, we see that all the bloody time. Corrupt port workers, shootings in broad daylight. It's, the country has certainly changed. Um, it may be the 501s, you know, the comancheros and people being chucked out of Aussie. But it is so apparently New Zealand is one of the most lucrative drug markets in the world because prices here are high because we've been somewhat successful in containing things. So um, yeah, he's talking about Mexican drug cartels, all sorts of people with an interest in what's going on here. Vast amounts of money and um, the, a big problem. Right. Ganglings was a sort of seminal work mm. when it came out. It, it, it was all over the media and it was famous for being banned in prisons and all that sort of things because mm. of the... How, because it's sort of <laughs> the <an> how, instructional. <laughs> yeah, the how-to manual. Yeah. Um, but back to your point, yeah, I mean, I have, I've had Aussie mates visiting saying, mm. you think it's bad here, mm. you want to try Sydney, you know, for ram raids. Mm. He said, you know, it, over there, it's totally just, it's, it's in steroids. Um, and he said, you know, and the, the, the level of gangland violence in Sydney is, you know, off the chart. So we, but we tend to look at it and go like, it's terrible here. But in fact, by comparison, we may be, it may not be, it's bad, it's got worse. Um, and it's been stirred up by the political forum mm. as as an issue and a book like this 
Does it bring a, a fair balance, do you think, to the what's going on, or does it actually fill in some information that we just don't know? Well, it's informational. And, I mean, these, these people are not shadowy figures. This, I don't know what's going to come up, but there's a photograph here, two fellas outside King's Cross Hotel, which I presume is in King's Cross, smiling broadly. Comanchero's boss, Duax Nakuru, left with Harkin Ayak. The pair have been living in Turkey where they allegedly control crime syndicates supplying drugs to New Zealand and Australia. So it's not like they're shy. They, they've been in the media because they were, they were arrested, weren't they, both of them? I hope so. They're um, for various crimes, so hopefully they're out of circulation. Yeah, but well, um, yeah, I'd be yeah. interested in that because, I mean, there's nothing more dispiriting, actually, at the moment when you're watching some dairy getting absolutely smacked oh, around yeah. and... Um, and going, this is a strange New Zealand, and yeah. um, it's so good luck to our, our new political masters on sorting it out. I don't. I think it's a pretty complex, challenging business. But the point he, I think, making here to a large extent is that oh, it's all very well to talk about it in terms of socio-economic deprivation and all that sort of stuff. But this is just a huge business, mm. like. <laughs> Yeah, like when you get, you know, the gang, you got, have call centres and things like that, um, <laughs> which is, it is kind of... Um, it's moved on from the days <laughs> when they used to chuck a pair of sneakers over yeah. the power lines to <laughs> donate that there's a tinny house and that they're open, I think. Yeah. So the other piece of New Zealand non-fiction, which is selling well, um, and this is... And so topical. So topical. Rugby is, I mean, it is the week. Yeah. So Smithy, called, subtitled, Endless Winters and the Spring of 22, Wayne Smith with Phil Gifford. So Phil Gifford. Legend. Uh, yeah, legend, legend. Sports writer. Loose head Len. Been everywhere, ever yeah. done anything. And Wayne Smith, who's the smartest man. They called him the professor for a reason. Never, apart from, he was assistant coach, one failed all black. For right. I think he was like the attacking offense, yeah, banks coach. When, you know, when, when they've had sort of multifaceted management teams where they couldn't <laughs> couldn't agree on anything. Uh, no, I mean, hey, and the cover, nice big strong lettering. You know exactly what it's about. Yeah, um, pretty stock standard cover for a sports book, really. It is, but, but the tight. I don't. I do like the lettering. Yeah, and um, and and. He was in the. He was in on my, you know, Google role today, saying the game has got to change. You know, mm. there, there are, and it is. There is a lot of debate about at the moment about how where rugby's ended up, mm. and you know, and the stats that are coming out of the semis now of how little rugby there actually is. You know, thirty minutes of play in an eighty-minute game. It's, well, and that's uh, apparently standard now. Well, I was watching poor old Ben O'Keefe who refereed the England. South Africa game, literally fighting with the players and saying, next time one of those water carriers comes on, I'm going to penalise the team. I know. Well, Get Nisbo rid of them. Nisbo said, there's six water boys on it, or six water guys on the ta on the floor, on the table, you know, on the field yeah. now. Six. And, and one of the, he was one of the England forwards, had just done some sort of big carry, um, and then he sat down for a while. And, and they take the shoe off. Or and O'Keefe yeah. said, I'll, if someone's injured, I'll stop the game. Otherwise, we're just going to keep going. Get on with it. Mm. Like no, it, it <laughs> no, it is. Even though they've got shot clocks on kicks now and all sorts yeah. of stuff like that, they, and, the, and there's this standing around before you go into a line out. And then the, where did that come from? I don't know where they come from. And where the, the breaks where it seems like there are team talks where they all get in a circle, you know, any stoppage of play yeah. to have a chat. Well, you that's probably all right if someone's injured and they're actually stop for a while well, but, but they, it's fake but, injuries but 30 seconds or 40 or a minute before every line out while well, i decide what to do i know no, no it is, it's a game it's never needs... like that at englewood high school <laughs> <laughs> but hey back to smithy um there's been several ruby tui you know mm. there have been several books about our great win with you know yeah. in the women's championship um this book here, more history of Smith. Well, yeah. is, is it his memoir? That's it's the his book. It's his memoir of life and rugby. Yeah, 
So the, one for the rugby fans and... Um, yeah, I think so. And perhaps one for those who are tracking the, the woman's game and its development. Um, he'll probably have a lot to say in that book. Well, he, and I haven't read those bits of it, but I think it's interesting to see how men get on coaching women um, and... Well, the, the Spanish coach you're talking about, well, <laughs> or the president. <laughs> yeah, see that you, you get maybe he gets that sort of dynamic in some teams, but also just, I mean, there's no like. Yeah, it's um, different. In the dressing room, it's like you can tell the coach to come in now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Apart from that sort of thing, I, I just wonder how how women these days, especially whether they like male coaches or would they prefer female coaches? Or? I think they would have been delighted to have got such a high level coach who put his hand up and, and transformed the way they were playing and they won. And, and Whereas because up until then they'd been rubbish. They were and they, they, and they came off that tour they just got smacked and, and to someone to reinvent yeah. the game the, 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 from the ground up. I, it's and it's a I watched, great story. I watched them play France the other day and they were rubbish again. Back, they were back looking average, weren't they? But um, <laughs> that, yeah, it's. Um, I think I think that's that's yeah, that Christmassy anyway. book for for a lot of uh, people too. We'll find that under the tree. Yeah. Anyway, have you got some more stuff? I do. I've got a couple ones. Um, How to stay alive by Bear Bear Grills. Grills, yeah. And um, so that's a few years old now. It's 2017, yeah. so we're giving it a six year. Somehow it found its way onto my desk, and it, it's it's kind of I do like books about um, skills, you mm. know, and and you know if it's like if you're in a little aeroplane, which every now and then you do find yourself in a little aeroplane, and the pilot keels over, can you you know can you land the plane? Can you land the plane? The, and there's, there's a section on that, you know, <laughs> a few pages, and it's like. Do not touch the automatic pilot, <laughs> <laughs> and you know you uh, you know you and how to get co get some comms to the ground, and then you know and some basics about things not to touch and do touch and all that sort of stuff. Very useful. I like this book, um, and I like Bear. I mean, he is he's a bit of a ledge. Mm. Um, Chief Scout. He's quite religious, I think. Is he? Oh, he's, the... So he's written one or two. Um, you know, Didn't how to clean up your act sort of books, oh, okay. as well as some of the more survival -y things. 20 books. Hmm. So he's he's been, he's he gets them out there amongst all his TV programs. He's also, he's also written some sort of young adult action uh, uh, fiction for 14-year-olds. Yeah, you, know, you know, multimedia type hmm. books, movies, you know, television, the whole thing. But there's the basic survival of things, like I do, you know, like what to have in your backpack and, and your kit. Oh, wait, I love that. I know that's a big topic in America with survivalists. Um, and it's like, but how to, you know, how to look, handle your water and make it safe and, and sort of like um, make a little fire or shelter or navigate. Uh, how to handle yourself in a fight was fascinating. You know, well, you just read Jack Reacher books for that. Well, he goes like, he says it's going to last five seconds. And he says... It's going to be life altering, and you know, it's going to be a um, single sort of moment, and you are going to need immediate medical help soon as soon after it's finished. Um, he says, "Run away or strike first, but win." <laughs> and it's kind of like he throws the first unexpected blow, and then he goes through how to do that. But he goes, "It's only going to last seconds." <laughs> Don't think that it's going to be, you know, just a handbaggy thing. A serious confrontation is serious. And I like all that. Um, about it's, I mean, how to drive a, a, a car, you know, off-road. Like, that's kind of cool. And um, how to survive, how to cross rivers, what's the latest theory on all that. I loved all that. Um, earthquakes and floods and little ideas about fires and what happens if a dog attacks you um so this is a good book to have with you at all times just in case a dog rocks no, no, up you, 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 you've got to be like it's like it's, can, you, can you say steady on rover while i go to chapter 17 yes no no <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the big thing is like it's a lot of it's military and, and it's sort of like hmm. um little acronyms which you know little letters but they're like don't rush stop and consider 
airways, breathing, circulation, these little things that, which he then re goes to, no, actually you need a better one. And his like is like, um, you know, realize the danger or whatever, try and get the, your head around that, respond, are you okay type of things, if you're with people who are that, shout, um, catastrophic bleeding, um, the airways, CPR, circulation, that sort of stuff. Short sections, it's all two or three pages, mm. little keep it simple type of um, graphics, uh, being prepared, and he goes, your best tool is your brain. And, you know, if you can just harness the moment and think, yeah. you're giving yourself a chance. Um, and it's, I, I, you know, I, I kind of enjoyed it. And, I, I, you know, you, it's... You, how did you get hold of it and why? I, well, it's just, it's one of those books, you know, there's a stand of books, mm. you know, and it's like they'll have a theme like the outdoors. Mm. And so I'm a, I'm a, I go like... Yeah, I mean, I'm probably never going to go too much outdoors. I, I can't see myself up in the Tararuas or the Rimutakas again, mm. unless my plane is crashing into them or something or other. Yeah, well, That's, that doesn't always end well. No, that ends going to end badly. But, but the, um, it is, it, it is a book that makes you think because you could be caught in earthquakes or fire or mm. things, things like that sort of stuff. Bound to that, be at some um, point. Yeah, and it's. How to, how to handle fire, just the basics of that is very, we all need to know a little bit about that stuff. Anyway, I, I enjoyed that. That mm. was um, bare, quick read, little short sections. Over to you. Okay. So I got a couple of biographies, I suppose you'd call them. Um, Billy Connolly, new book, Rambling Man, My Life on the Road. So this is not really a sequential story of his life. This is kind of little bits about all the places that he's been. And there is a song, I think, Slim Dusty, I've Been Everywhere, Man, or something. There is a New Zealand version and a world version. Yep. Yeah, so Billy's been everywhere. And he's written about nearly everything. Um, he's great on TV. He's great on books. I've never yeah. seen him live. You've... I've seen him live. Oh, okay. He was amazing. I don't know. It was sort of a, I don't know, an hour long, hour and a half show or something. And he started off talking about something, and then he just went off on all sorts of odd tangents and then finished up kind of back where he started in a logical sequence. But in the meantime, he'd just been everywhere, and it's not like he had notes or anything. Yeah. Um, no, that's a, what a gift. Yeah. So he, you get the impression it's completely random, then you realise it's not. Now that's often, it was like Churchill writing his fantastic speeches and then standing up in Parliament and just disclaiming them as though mm. he's just making them up. Mm. Spent weeks constructing these magnificent moments. Mm. But then to deliver it, like in this case Connolly, yeah. uh, in front of an audience um, and playing his banjo. The, um, yeah. But that's, he, it's hard to, it's hard to explain humour. That that's a challenge, and yeah. I, I think if you tried to tell, if you'd heard a Billy Connolly joke and then you try and tell it, it it's not. No, it's not. It doesn't work because no. it's he's the he's the story. Yeah. Um, his 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 nature is is is. Yeah. So the little um, bit on the back, if you like, I don't know what you call it. If it's on the back, I've met the weirdest and most wonderful people who walk the earth seen the most bizarre and the most fantastic sights, and I've really come across something I couldn't get a laugh at. I don't think I've ever had a bad trip, well, apart from in the 1970s, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah. There's been a lot of Billy Connolly books, mm. and, and he is a man of age now. And there has been... And of failing health. Failing health, um, you know, Parkinson's, is it, or something like that. Um, so to get another book out... Um, you know, it's it is terrific. Hmm. You you've started it. Yeah, I will just read you this a little bit. Uh, happened to me several times when I was alone, but it also happened to me when I was in a Manhattan restaurant with with Eric Idle. A woman came up to the table and addressed me. It's wonderful to see you. You're a hero of mine. I said thank you very much. Then she said, Where are the rest of the guys? I said, Which guys? She said. The rest of the Monty Python gang. And I said, you think I'm John Cleese, don't you? Well, I'm not. 
Eric was pissing himself. She said, no, no, you're not going to get away with that, away that easily. I'm not John Cleese, I'm Billy Connolly. She refused to believe it. Oh, I get it, you're incognito. When we were leaving, she waved and called out cheerily, bye, John. <laughs> <laughs> no. Great little anecdotes. The, yeah. um, so that's what it's about, just bits of his life, bits of fun. Yeah, that, that, that is also a classic Christmassy, you know, curl up at the beach. And it reminds me of, of the Sam Neill type of book. Um, yeah. you know, that's sort of like, it's an entertainment. Bit. And yeah. it's a, you know, they're good company, those guys. Mm. Um, a final book from me, some fiction. Really? I mean, in fact, I had, I read, I've had a couple of fiction books running. I, I read the latest Joe Nisbo. Yep. Uh, Killer Moon was the title. Uh, um, yeah, I think so. It's, it's, got, got, a, it's, it's got, got the multicolored title cover. Yeah. It's not the Harry, the new, the last Harry Holley one. It's the other one, isn't it? No, this is the last Harry Holley one, oh, and okay. this this is a short stories one, right? Um, which I've seen it almost. Yeah, and. This one is the last adventure of, of Harry at the moment. Oh, right, right, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Where Harry yeah. is, is washed up in L.A., yeah. alcoholic, and, you know, in a previous one he was washed up in Hong Kong and um, befriends a woman who is then has loaned a lot of money and is the loan sharks, the Mexican cartel boy type things, are now wanting their million back from this failed film venture and... They really kidnapped her, and um, he gets an opportunity to go back and work for a very wealthy um, Norwegian who's in trouble with um, in in the capital of Norway. And but his fee he negotiates can be the the sum to mm. save his um, his buddy in L.A. And so he arrives back, and away we go with, and he forms his little team. The the, the, the psychologist has, who's now very old and, and is in hospice sort of type, type care mm. and he's part of it and his usual mates. So if you've followed the books, the, the characters have advanced their careers and have done things and so they're being still being referred to and there's backstory and you need to know a little bit about the death of Raquel, his wife and and the people that were swirling around there as he gets into the case mm. and uh, it's a tricky little entertaining case but it is dark as you know there's it's pretty um grim grim nordic detailing and it's a lot of it's to do with parasites and their effects on humans and um having them and they create um, kind of alter personalities and it's um, this and decapitation all over the place it's it's kind of um, one for the the serious Nordic noir fan um, but it, in the end I found myself rushing through it and mm. really quite happy to get to the end and and it was predictable mm. predictable in all its twists you know, which we've, um, and it's, the case seems to get solved early, but then it twists away and the 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 bad guys are often worse than you think, but <laughs> more things have to be revealed and it's, um, and all the moral dilemmas of, of a, and Harry was one of the, the great sort of early alcoholic um, coping with that um mm. this time he's got better suits but he's still kind of um struggling with all those demons and um which is now kind of a little bit more commonplace of the the, the fraught investigator well they all seem to be have to be like that don't they that's their nature yeah mm. that the harry anyway that was it was harry as opposed to commissar brunetti from donna leon who Goes home for lunch and That's <laughs> it's a, it's a, it has an espresso and a nap and solves the crime by lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. way more civilized, way more civilized. But here, and the other one I really did did like a little wee slim penguin, um, too far from Antibay, by Bay Bay B E D E Scott. I'm thinking that's Antibes, isn't it? Antibes? Why not? Yeah, Antibes. 
Antibes. Antibes, right. Yes. And which is in France, but yes. this book is totally in sight, set in Saigon. And in fact, um, the author lives in Singapore, so he's got that sort of Asian mm. knowledge thing going. Um, so who's written that? Bede Scott. Bede Scott, yeah. And it's, it's dedicated to Eric Ambler. Who now he was he he lived from nineteen oh nine to nineteen ninety eight and he was a English spy um and thriller writer. Yes. And he you may go back and you might remember The Mask of Dimitros. Hmm. His classic big book. Um Topaki was another Oh, okay, that was a movie. A Shirley MacLaine, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, and and also he was like the screenwriter for um, Nicholas Montserrat's The Cruel Sea mm -hmm. and all that. Um, and he has the sort of, his books always had the sort of anti-hero, um, the amateur who bumbles along and surprises us on how capable and getting to a solution. And I've got it here. Graham Greene, Ian Fleming, John le Carre, Alan First and Frederick Forsyth have all said they uh, would owe a lot to Eric Ambler. He was one of those early guys who created a genre hmm. of which they felt they could develop. And um, so there we go. Um, the back cover. 1951, Jean-Loc Gouet has arrived in Indochina to investigate the murder of his brother, Oliver, whose body was found floating in the tributary of the Saigon River. As an avid reader of detective fiction, um, Gouet is well aware of how such an investigation should proceed, but it is not immediately clear that he is capable of putting the knowledge into practice. In addition to being a reporter of an obscure provincial newspaper, he's also a failed writer, an incorrigible alcoholic, and a compulsive gambler who's already squandered a fortune in the casinos of the Côte d'Azur. <laughs> Despite his, absolute, his dissolute tendencies, however, and his aversion to physical danger, Gray does eventually manage to solve the case. In order to do so, he's obliged to enter a world of elaborate conspiracies, clandestine intelligence operations, and organized crimes, only to discover in the novel's final pages the truth behind his, final, his brother's murder is far stranger than he could have imagined. Um, back in 19, it's back in 1950s. It is delightfully French, mm. intelligent, absolutely clever. It's smart, it's sharp, it's philosophical. Everybody smokes like nobody's <laughs> business. Um, and he's a great fan of May Maigre, Simeon's Maigre. Yeah. And so he's trying to, the character is trying to think, how would Maigre handle all these situations? Um, but he's bumbling along. Um, <laughs> many, many references to crime novels. People who love crime writing will just find this little slim volume a delight. Um, now, uh, he's fun. This is, this is much to enjoy on this. I didn't think the cover did anything. No. That would be like in our top ten worst covers of the year for yes. Penguin. Yeah. It's in some nondescript, you can't even tell this is Saigon. That could be in a lot of places. Yes. Um, Except it, generally in the movies, the fella on that little motorbike is about to kill someone. He's going to... It's yeah. Poke, poke, poke his gun through that window and, and the, blow the, someone away. And the car is sort of that like Cuba type yeah. vibes going thing. Um, but despite the cover, which is and you know Penguin haven't done Mr. Scott any favours here. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a um, a much recommended and a, a beautifully slim book. Um, you know, that packs a punch. And this is my argument. Often these slim books can over-deliver. Mm. They absolutely are. There's been great editor editorial work. This is tight as. Someone's put some effort into making all the words count. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a, a little ripper. And our final book of the day, our oh. biggest book of the day. Oh, yeah. Just taking this out of the box. Uh, most people have heard it's coming. Um, Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson. Isaacson is probably the most prominent current biographer. His best-selling book, probably the one on Steve Jobs, but he's written heaps. Uh, and this, of course, is about Elon Musk, who's the most extraordinary man. Um, Great cover. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's really in your face. We're going to need to cut off now, but yeah. I want, would like some, where they, a little bit more work on that perhaps mm. to tell us how, I mean, he's in, he's in the news a lot. Um, mm -hmm. For all sorts of reasons, so he's a, a, a significant man that we all perhaps should be know perhaps a little bit more about. We've got to we've got to understand how he does things and why he does the things he does, because everything in the end seems to work out. It's like it's like he had a plan, but it's not <laughs> obvious. I the mean, plan what, may become obvious. In, what the in, hell was he doing with Twitter? But maybe he's got a plan. I don't know. It's cost him forty billion dollars or something. Yeah. Most people would notice that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thanks from um, Steve and I. Um, you can catch this um, program on Elmo's Bookshop's Facebook page. We look forward to catching up with you um, in November. And that is it. Press the button.